This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hi, it's Shelby, and I am absolutely thrilled to tell you about my new Spotify original from Parcast, Mediums. This eight-episode series takes a closer look at the mortal lives of spiritualists who claim to communicate with the dead, and the scientists who tried to debunk them. Join me every Wednesday as I expose the paranormal events proven to be hoaxes and those which have mystified even the world's greatest skeptics. Were they all simply parlor tricks? Or was there something truly celestial going on? Decide for yourself in this exclusive look at our first episode. If you enjoy it, be sure to follow Mediums free on Spotify to catch the rest of the series. The first time my husband took me home to Mississippi, we decided to visit a Civil War battlefield in Vicksburg. To get there, you drive along this road that runs through parts of the battlefield. At one point, we were going through this heavily wooded area and something happened. The woods went eerily quiet, like someone hit the mute button. We saw trees moving, but couldn't hear their leaves rustle in the wind. No birds, no cicadas, just silence. My husband slowed to a stop. Both of us were incredibly unsettled. Then... We started to hear men's voices. They sounded surprised, like they weren't expecting to see us. Their whispers were coming in over the radio, so we turned the car off. That's when the voices got even louder, like they were speaking right into my ear. Then, as quickly as they arrived, they vanished, and the sounds of the forest returned. We sat there until a car pulled up behind us and honked. So, why am I telling you this story? Well, maybe it's because we've all had an incident like this. Not necessarily a ghost story, but something unexplained. And if you're like me, you've always wondered about those fringe moments in our lives. You've wondered, are there things really happening just beyond our senses? Are there unexplainable forces that influence us every day? And maybe, most importantly... Could there be people more in touch with these forces than the rest of us? If any of these questions pique your curiosity, we've got the perfect series for you. Welcome to Mediums. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. For the next eight episodes, we're going to be exploring the world of spiritualism and the women that defined it. Whether or not you believe in mediums and their communion with the spirit world, it's undeniable that the impact of this 19th century movement still permeates so many different parts of our culture. It's a wild ride. We've got everything from obvious con artists to 150-year-old mysteries. We're starting with one of the most intriguing of them all. Her name was Leonora Piper, and to this day, she's the only 19th century medium who's never been debunked. Her story starts on a sticky August morning in New Hampshire, 1865. The air was so thick, little Leonora Piper felt like she was breathing through a straw. Her chemise was already soaked through, clinging to her cotton stockings. Despite the heat, the eight-year-old went tearing across the grassy field behind her home in search of a hiding spot. When she reached the tree line, she dove into the forest and crouched behind a twisting, gnarled oak. She heard footsteps inching nearer. She willed herself to be invisible. Her heart was pounding in her throat. 
But after a moment, she realized the forest was quiet. The footsteps had stopped. Slowly, still pressed against the tree, she dared to peek around the corner. She was alone. Then, without warning, something hit her ear. She spun around, expecting to see her brother, but the woods were empty. Except it felt like someone was there. A presence, almost like body heat, hovered behind her. Leonora felt something breathe on her neck. Then, a low, snake-like voice whispered in her ear. Terrified, she ran back to the house, crying for her mother. Through chokes and sobs, she explained what happened and the message whispered in her ear. Aunt Sarah said she wasn't dead, but with you still. Her mother was confused. Aunt Sarah lived a few towns over and was presumably alive and well. A few days later, a letter arrived from her brother-in-law. Sarah had passed away, unexpectedly, at the precise time that Leonora came running into the house. It was her first glance at the spirit world, a place many have longed to see. Let me take you back to a dark and chaotic world, the turn of the 19th century, when the Industrial Revolution lured people into big, lonely cities. Picture dingy factories, overcrowded apartments, soot layering the windowsills, the streets, people's lungs. You get the picture. Soot was everywhere. It was a cold, alien world where sunshine was a rarity. And not just for the working class— The upwardly mobile lived in dark, cavernous homes full of secret passageways and hidden staircases for the house staff who were expected to be neither seen nor heard. So even though these homes were full of servants, it was usually so quiet you could hear a pin drop across the hall or a teacup clatter in the other room. You might wake to the sounds of footsteps inches from your bed, with no one standing there to claim them. As you snuck downstairs for a midnight snack, it would be commonplace to see something stir in the shadows, then vanish, or for the gas lantern at the end of the hall to go dark for a moment, as though someone crossed in front of it. Plus, the carbon monoxide those gas lamps emitted caused hallucinations, turning any creak or groan into a monster going bump in the night. It was hard to shake the feeling that you were always being watched. It created a strange new reality, one where some of the West's longest standing beliefs were being questioned. Take Emanuel Swedenborg. In the 1720s, he proposed a radical idea. Heaven wasn't some far-off place, but rather a reality parallel to our own, sewn to ours like the underside of a stitch. But every so often, that stitch would rip, and a dead spirit was allowed to seep through. I know, I know. This was crazy at first. But fast forward 100 years, and the creaks and groans of those homes, the eerie, unexplained noises, the hiss of gas... Suddenly, Swedenborg's ideas started to seem like maybe they weren't so crazy after all, even for some very esteemed men of science. William James was six years old when the modern spiritualist movement became mainstream. He remembered hearing about the Fox sisters, two teenage girls in upstate New York who spoke to the dead through raps and knocks. His father, Henry, a man of affluence and means, raised James to believe in Swedenborg's afterlife. James was never completely sold on spiritualism itself, but he didn't think his father was mentally ill for believing in ghosts. In fact, he was one of the most well-reasoned men James ever knew. When James enrolled at Harvard in 1861, he said as much to his classmates and was nearly laughed out of the room until he presented an argument that was hard to ignore, 
Whether or not spirits were real, the people who encountered them saw something. Whatever they experienced was real to them. And it was a shame that the scientific community was never curious enough to investigate. James wanted to study the mediums who facilitated so many of these supernatural experiences, searching for those who could truly speak with ghosts. In doing so, he believed he could prove the existence of the afterlife. Unfortunately, the case study James was looking for was hundreds of miles away in New Hampshire, and at the time, a very grumpy two-year-old. I'd like to take a moment to assure you that the story you're about to hear, the story of Leonora Piper, is an utterly bizarre one. I'd love to tell you that it was all fabricated, and I probably would if it wasn't for the sheer number of people that wanted Leonora to be completely normal, starting with her parents. Stillman and Hannah Simons loved their raven-haired, chubby-cheeked little girl. Leonora was a sometimes sweet and sometimes fussy toddler. Her parents cared for her with the same love and patience they showed to her three older siblings. But something about Leonora wasn't right. She had a habit of looking past people, distracted by empty corners and still rooms. And then, when she was eight, there was that incident in the woods. Until her dying day, Hannah Simons remembered the fear in her daughter's voice when she came barreling in the kitchen, cradling her right ear. It was bright red, like she had been slapped. And then, the message about Aunt Sarah. Hannah was so unnerved that she detailed the whole ordeal in her journal, including the exact time that Leonora came running toward the house. A few days later, when that awful letter from her brother-in-law arrived, Hannah noticed that her sister's time of death matched the time in her journal exactly. The Simons were an upstanding Methodist family who knew better than to believe in ghosts. So they decided to overlook Leonora's premonition as though it never happened. But like most things swept under the rug, the problem only festered. Ghosts followed Leonora whispering in her ear as she fell asleep, or sitting beside her during church. Once, as she sat reading a book in the living room, she felt her stomach leap into her chest. It felt like she was free-falling off a bridge. Leonora panicked as the living room fell farther and farther away. Blackness began crowding her periphery, and she kept falling— until it seemed as though she was looking at her living room through a manhole. She tried to scream, but couldn't find her voice. Finally, she stopped falling, but everything was dark. She couldn't see her hand waving in front of her face. She was simply floating, not in anything, but she felt the darkness clinging to her. The next thing she remembered was her mother's voice frantically calling her name. She felt hands on her arms. Then, she was back in her living room, her mother shaking her, tear-stained. Leonora had been unconscious for two hours. Nobody said it, but the entire town knew she was different. She was glared at in church and avoided at the market. Even when she kept to herself, she took up too much space. Her powers became a curse she longed to understand. Leonora was desperate for a clean slate, a chance to be normal. This is another piece of the story that I can't quite reconcile. How desperate Leonora was to not have some sort of extrasensory ability. If she was going to such great lengths to trick people, she certainly would have needed to start this fabricated reluctance early and make life-altering decisions merely in the name of the con. Like many women before her, she saw marriage as a way out of her small town and its rumor mill. And so, at the young age of 22, she married a respectable shopkeeper named William Piper. She moved with him to the Beacon Hill neighborhood of Boston. 
and for the first time in her life, Leonora was nobody. At least, for a little while. Up next, Leonora discovers that when you're born to be a mouthpiece for the dead, it's hard to stay silent for long. Now, back to the story. In her new neighborhood in Boston, Leonora Piper resolved to lead a normal life. She tried to ignore the whispers that followed her around Beacon Hill, not only the voices of the dead, but the hushed gossip that made its way over each picket fence she passed. They all knew. Death clung to Leonora like a smell, and she felt foolish for thinking she could wash it away. Soon, the entire neighborhood felt hollow and brittle, as unsettling to Leonora as she was to them. Until one night, in the dead of winter, when a young woman appeared on her doorstep. As Leonora ushered her inside and offered her tea, the young woman explained that she was in need of a talented medium. There was someone she desperately needed to talk to. Of course, this was the exact thing Leonora was trying to avoid and told the girl as much. But the more the girl insisted, the harder it became to say no, which is how they ended up in the study, curtains drawn, sitting in total silence. Leonora had never contacted a spirit on purpose before. She breathed deeply and focused on the steam rising from her visitor's teacup. Like muscle memory, her heart leapt and she began free falling. The teacup faded away into a vast nothingness. Her throat started vibrating. Her tongue danced in her mouth. Leonora started to speak, but with a voice not her own. And suddenly, she was back in the study, staring at a now cold cup of tea. Leonora looked up at the young woman, whose eyes were full of tears. She thanked Leonora profusely and tried to pay her, but Leonora wouldn't accept a penny. Instead, she asked the girl to tell no one about the sitting, partially because she valued her privacy, but mostly because, in all honesty, Leonora wasn't totally sure what happened. Even still, it was the first time her abilities helped someone. It was a nice feeling, frankly, even if it was just a one-time thing. Like most secrets, Leonora spread through Boston in a matter of days. It wasn't long until every morning was spent holding sittings in her husband's study. She didn't like the attention, but she pitied her clients too much to turn them away. People trusted Leonora based on reputation alone. She never advertised herself. She never published a biography. In fact, most of the information we have on Leonora was written by other people. She was truly doing her best to avoid her life's calling. Meanwhile, William James was looking for a calling of his own. After 21 years of analyzing the afterlife, he'd earned a break and decided to leave Massachusetts for an 18-month sabbatical around Europe, beginning with London. He met three scientists named Henry Sidgwick, Frederick Myers, and Edmund Gurney. They were philosophers and researchers who, like James, found contemporary views on spiritualism limiting. A few months prior, the trio dreamed up a society dedicated to the scientific study of paranormal phenomena. Unlike those who poked fun at mediumship, telepathy, and haunted houses, they'd study phenomena without prejudice, as they would for any scientific experiment. It would be, as Fred Meyer put it, an endeavor to learn the actual truth as to the destiny of man. And so they established the SPR, the Society for Psychical Research. But around campus, it was mostly called the Ghost Club, or Ghost Society, to be polite. The SPR was enthusiastic, but unsure of how to get started. Fortunately, James made plans to return home and established the American branch of the SPR in Boston. I want to take a moment to stress, these men might have been made fun of, 
but they believed in the scientific method, in empirical proof. They weren't looking just for ghost stories and haunted houses. They wanted genuine evidence that there were people in touch with an alternate plane of existence. Which brings us back to Leonora Piper. By the summer of 1885, the 26-year-old had made quite a name for herself. Aware of her notoriety, a friend asked her to meet with an elderly widow named Eliza Gibbons. Mrs. Gibbons recently suffered the loss of her grandson, Herman. He was 18 months when he passed, and his death still hung heavy in the house. The weight of it was suffocating her daughter and son-in-law. Leonora never remembered what happened while she was in a trance. But when she awoke, Mrs. Gibbons was tear-stained. She looked as though she could fully inhale for the first time in weeks. She assured Leonora that she got what she needed. She was able to speak with her grandson. And, she added, she knew Leonora was the real deal. While in the trance, she divulged a long-kept secret about Mrs. Gibbons that nobody not even her daughter Alice, knew. Mrs. Gibbons left in a haze, astounded by what she experienced. She found herself walking faster and faster, nearly racing home to tell Alice and her son-in-law, William James. Within an hour's time, James knew he'd found his inaugural test subject. But first, James needed to vet her, he asked his sister-in-law, Margaret, to bring Leonora a sealed envelope and to ask her to describe the person who wrote the letter inside. Now, at the time, tons of mediums performed this kind of trick on stage. They all had different ways of reading the letter without needing to open the envelope, which is why James gave Leonora a letter she'd never be able to read. The entire thing was in Italian. Even still, she took the envelope from Margaret and, without hesitation, began to accurately describe the sender. She never even looked down at the envelope and still guessed that the writer was Italian. The experiment convinced James that Leonora had supernormal powers and asked her to sign on to an in-depth study. James explained that the ASPR had no interest in debunking her. Rather, they had the resources to fully investigate her abilities— they just wanted to make sense of her gift. I have to imagine that this was an impossible offer to pass up. Even if she was skeptical about how effective it might be, her talents were as much of a mystery to her as they were to the ASPR. Eventually, she promised that if James could truly help her understand these powers, she'd give him the access he was hoping for. And again, this hesitancy was either another step in the longest con of spiritualism, or Leonora really was overwhelmed by her abilities and truly looking for help. James wrote to England about the ASPR's first case study, and they couldn't have been more gung-ho. Except SPR member Richard Hodgson, who, in his heart of hearts, didn't believe that anyone was truly psychic, let alone some housewife from Boston. To prove his point, he hired detectives to tail Leonora and her husband, Bill, until he could get to Beacon Hill and stalk them himself. To him, it was only a matter of time before Leonora slipped up. Let me just repeat this real quick. Hodgson was so hellbent on exposing this woman who earnestly volunteered that he had people follow her like she was a mob boss. But because she was a housewife and not a criminal, these guys were tailing her to the grocery store or to afternoon tea. When Hodgson arrived in Boston a month later, he received an astonishing report from his detectives. They found absolutely nothing to indict Leonora, like whatsoever. She never tried to research the people she sat with and barely read the newspaper. There were no secret meetings or sudden changes in schedule, no visits to the fresh graves at the local cemetery. If anything, she could stand to get out more. Hodgson stared at these men in disbelief before kindly kicking them out of his office. In the morning, 
Hodgson sent Leonora a full report of the detective's findings, which was how she found out that a man she never heard of was paying two private investigators to stalk her. She contacted William James and in the sternest voice she'd ever used, told him she was backing out of the research experiment. Respectable people, she seethed, do not come to find that detectives have trailed them about town. James panicked. He raced to the Piper household, banging on the door until an ill-tempered Leonora cracked it open. He launched into an apology on behalf of Hodgson. He asked her to see the humor in the situation. She slammed the door in his face and closed all the window curtains. He pleaded through the door, Leonora, if there's anyone capable of helping you to understand your gifts, it's Hodgson. He's your best hope. A few days later, James received a note from Leonora, agreeing to meet the skeptic. Thrilled, he wrote back, Hodgson is perhaps the most high-minded and truthful man I know. That might have been James's opinion, but as far as I see it, Hodgson is one giant red flag. Hodgson was obsessive and diligent, which is admirable in and of itself, but his need to be the one to find the truth overrode all sorts of ethical boundaries. I have no doubt that he was high-minded and truthful, but he was a lot. The winter of 1888 was the worst Boston had ever seen. It snowed constantly. The wind cut through any overcoat and pierced the skin, freezing the very marrow in their bones. Even so, Richard Hodgson sat outside the Piper's house, observing Leonora and her family through the windows, just as he'd done every day for over a year. After giving Hodgson the green light, Leonora understood why James put so much faith in him. The man was relentless and his mind never stopped turning. He was fully committed to the cause. It was admirable, if a little creepy. He also observed her sittings, taking diligent notes. He was always astounded by the accuracy of her readings. Though none of them would be as haunting as the reading she'd give to William James. Now, back to the story. On a particularly glum morning in the late 1880s, William James's wife, Alice, asked for a favor. She was worried about her aunt, Kate Walsh. Aunt Kate lived out of town and had been sick for some time. Her letters were fewer and farther between and recently stopped coming altogether. Would Leonora use her gifts to check on her? Leonora was quiet for several minutes before announcing that Aunt Kate was already in the room. She'd died earlier that morning, sometime between midnight and 2 a.m. A day later, the Jameses received a somber telegram from Kate's husband. Once again, Leonora was exactly right. This is the second time Leonora heralded someone's death, and it's why I find her so compelling— By all accounts, there's no possible way she could have predicted the things she did. These weren't things she could infer from personalities. She was detailed, eerily accurate, and studied closely by men of science. That's right. Even after two years, Richard Hodgson was still following Leonora's every move. But they'd actually come to enjoy one another's company. Well, tolerate it, at least. Hodgson and Leonora butted heads constantly, but even still, a certain level of familiarity was there. But he had to wonder if they'd grown too close to their test subject, if they'd let their guard down just enough for her to pull the wool over their eyes. I wonder this too, because James is our primary source on Leonora. Their quote-unquote friendship with her really throws a wrench in our idea of her, If all this empirical evidence that we're getting was, in fact, biased, then I don't really know what to make of the story at all. Fortunately, James and Hodgson had a contingency plan, though for Leonora, it might have been a bit unpleasant. It was clear that they needed to distance themselves from her, at least for a while. And luckily, 
there was a physicist in Manchester who was dying to meet her. Oliver Lodge was the SPR's telepathy specialist. He'd spent the past year working on an early version of the radio. To him, sending messages through space wasn't that far removed from reading people's thoughts. Lodge suspected that Leonora Piper wasn't a medium, but a telepath. She wasn't actually talking to the dead. She was reading people's minds. Because to Lodge, that made much more plausible sense. And he intended to prove it by exposing her as a fraud. From the moment she stepped through the door, Leonora was treated like a test subject, and Lodge was determined to keep the study as controlled as possible. Her luggage was confiscated and searched. Lodge read and censored Leonora's mail. Miserably, his family wasn't allowed to talk to her about anything more in-depth than the weather. Even the actual experiments could be frustrating. One day, he invited a skeptic for a sitting. Leonora felt his judgment the second he stepped into the room. The man sat, and a heavy silence followed. The pair sized one another up for a few moments. Until Leonora began to fall into that eternal but familiar blackness. Of course, the skeptic rolled his eyes, convinced it was an act. The corner of his lip curled, full of contempt, as Leonora began to speak. The man before her had four children. One of them was a flower. No, a daisy. A little daisy. Leonora could see her deep brown eyes. She traced her finger along the scar, zigzagging across one of her eyebrows. Leonora paused. There was another thing. She was lame. The skeptic raised an eyebrow. He did have four children, the youngest of which, a little girl called Daisy, was scarred from an old injury. But, he thought, she wasn't lame. Oh, I'm sorry, Leonora said. Not lame. That's a neighbor's child. Daisy is deaf. The man turned pale. Leonora went on. She had a message for him, but he commanded her to stop. He stood, strode out of the study, and left without another word. Days later, he told Lodge that he never wanted to see Leonora again. Every single detail had been right. Lodge was convinced that, at the very least, she was a true telepath. But was she actually communicating with spirits? He contacted an uncle down in London, whose brother died some 20 years back. Lodge asked his uncle Robert to send something that once belonged to his brother. Anything would do. Robert chose a gold watch. Leonora sat with it, turning the timepiece in her hands. When she next spoke... Her voice was lower and smooth. She said, This is my watch. I'm here. I'm Jerry. And I'm here. Jerry talked about a rifle he had as a kid and a prized snakeskin he kept in his closet. He described the neighborhood and the kids he played with. Uncle Robert confirmed most of what Leonora repeated. For the details he couldn't remember, Lodge sent private investigators to ask some of Jerry's old neighbors and schoolmates. Apparently, she nailed every single detail, convincing Lodge that she was truly a medium. But if that's true, and this is the exact reason I find this so fascinating, if true, she also proved that there is life after death. By the spring of 1890... Six months after Leonora Piper arrived on his doorstep, Oliver Lodge felt he had tried his very best to debunk her. He sent her back to Boston to her husband, Bill, convinced she was a talented medium. But, as usual, Richard Hodgson needed to see for himself. In fact, he continued to conduct experiments on Leonora for another 13 years. Unfortunately, The more tests she passed, the more extreme they got. 
When she was in trance states, he'd pour salt down her throat or pinch her until her skin bruised, but never managed to wake her. She wouldn't notice the marks until days later, clueless as to how she got them. Then one day, Hodgson filled Leonora's mouth with laundry detergent, which at the time was basically lye. If you've ever seen a 19th century period piece, I guarantee there was a scene about lye almost burning off someone's skin. So I'm not exaggerating when I say it could have killed her. When she eventually broke her trance and ran to the sink to spit it out, Leonora felt enraged. After 18 years of near flawless sittings, Hodgson was so desperate to get the better of her that he shoved poison down her throat. It was a breaking point she never intended to reach, but she was done. Which forces us to ask the question, why did it take this long? Leonora's been followed, tested over and over, forced into isolation, often treated like a lab rat, all in the name of a society she wasn't really connected to in the first place. If she was a fraud, it drives me crazy trying to understand her motivation. So I won't get too into it, but it's just another piece of the story that doesn't quite add up, especially considering Leonora's actions after she quits for the last time. She couldn't tell Hodgson directly that she was quitting. He was far too dogged to let her go. Instead, she gave an interview to the New York Herald, announcing her retirement from the American Society for Psychical Research. When James read the morning news, he raced to intervene. He convinced Hodgson to stay home for once, abandoning his daily post outside the Piper home. Then, James sprinted to Leonora's, where he spent the rest of the day trying to make things right. He ended up returning several days in a row before Leonora finally let him in, which, in fairness, was a huge improvement over their last fight. James perhaps thought that his powers of persuasion are what convinced Leonora to come back, but it's much more likely that Hodgson was the driving force. After all these years, she and Hodgson developed a deep respect for one another. They argued often. Hodgson always believed himself to be smarter than Mrs. Piper. Leonora thought Hodgson could be an overblown ass. But they were ingrained in one another, like those friends you've just known forever. When the study first resumed, they were cold to one another. But the ice thawed day by day, until things were almost back to normal. In fact, Leonora gradually began feeling excited about the work again. A year in, it felt like a breakthrough was on the horizon. One night, anticipation kept her awake, no matter how heavy her eyelids felt. Those jitters turned to nerves, which she tried to assuage with a cup of warm milk. It was past midnight when she drifted off to sleep, but her dreams provided little comfort. A large, shadowy figure appeared to her, reaching out with a rough, calloused hand. She thought it looked like Hodgson's. Then she snapped awake, feeling nauseous. Leonora didn't dream of friends often, but when she did, horrible news always followed. This time, it arrived shortly after breakfast. William James came over, hat in hand, to inform her that, late last night, Richard Hodgson died of a heart attack. After Hodgson's death, Leonora continued on with the ASPR for the better part of 10 years. But over time, she lost her edge. Everyone who worked with her agreed that accurate readings became fewer and farther between. Perhaps decades of being used as a test subject had worn her down. Or maybe... As scientist Amy Tanner later put it, no psychic, even the best one, lasted forever. William James staked his entire career on Leonora's reputation. Because of her, he's still regarded as one of the most remarkable philosophers to emerge from the 19th century. He once said of her, "'If you wish to upset the law that all crows are black,' You mustn't seek to show that no crows are. It is enough if you prove one single crow to be white. 
my own white crow, is Mrs. Piper. So what do we make of Leonora Piper? Does it prove that mediums can be real? That an afterlife is waiting for us? I want to believe Leonora was legit. I mean, first of all, if she was a fraud, she duped the world for nearly 70 years until her death in 1950, which might be even more amazing than talking to the dead. And at the end of the day, does it really matter? There were people who needed her to be real. And maybe that's more important than the honest truth. At least, that's something I'll be asking myself throughout the rest of this series. If you get what you pay for, can you really be conned? If anyone could settle that debate, it'd be Madame Blavatsky, the most famous medium of the 19th century. In our next episode, I'll tell you all about the woman labeled as one of the most ingenious imposters in history. And the more her tricks were exposed, the more popular she got. Thanks for listening to Mediums. I also want to thank Sir Arthur Conan Doyle for his book, The History of Spiritualism and historian Deborah Blum for authoring Ghost Hunters, William James, and the Search for Scientific Proof of Life After Death. These books were tremendously helpful in researching this episode. Once again, I'm Shelby Scott, here to remind you that death is only the beginning. Mediums is a Spotify original from Parcast. It is executive produced by Max Cutler, sound design by Michael Langsner, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro, Trent Williamson, Carly Madden, and Aaron Larson. This episode of Mediums was written by Aaron Lan, with writing assistance by Abigail Cannon, fact-checking by Haley Milligan, and research by Mickey Taylor. I'm Shelby Scott. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the first episode of my new series, Mediums. If you'd like to hear episode two and continue the series, be sure to follow Mediums free on Spotify. You can catch a new episode every Wednesday.